Thank you, Nancy. So how's everyone doing tonight? Good. I just want to thank you all for coming. I think it's, uh, it's finally nice to talk about something fun. And doing business presentations and stuff like that, it's a, it's a great topic. So just by a show of hands, who, who knows a lot about the crash? <laughs> got a few, few people? All right, so good. We've got a good audience, so that's, that's great. So uh, I'll start off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Get the slides going. So, um, so Eric Evans, I uh, was born in Lexington, Kentucky, so a little, little, little ways from here. Okay. Um, and we moved when I was eight years old to the suburb of Philadelphia. Eric, and, can yeah. you get a little closer to the microphone? Oh, sure. I'll carry it with you or whatever. That? That's good, okay. Um, moved to Linfield when I was age 20. I'm not a historian, but I do love history. And I was influenced by my father's interest in planes, plane crashes. We were always talking about, you know, in the 70s, why this plane crashed or what happened to it or whatever. So. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, and I've, I've been here in North Reading for about 13 years. Uh, so how did I discover the topic, you know, plane crash here in North Reading? So I was um, watching some news clip about how a B-25 bomber um, hit the Empire State Building back in 1945. It was a, a military plane as well. Um, it was a Saturday in July, just like it was here. So there's like a little connection that I didn't know at the time. And the uh, <clears throat> pilot was um, transporting people back from the war, and he was trying to get into Newark Airport from, um, I forget exactly where they were coming from. And he, uh, he wanted to land, um, but it was really foggy. Again, almost just like the accident was here, really foggy. And um, ended up crashing right in the world, the um, Empire State Building, oh. and between the 78th and 80th floor. And that's a pretty good sized hole in the building. Uh, one engine shot through the south side of the um, of the building, and the other one went right down the elevator chute. Took out all the elevators. Um, the elevator shaft. The resulting fire extinguisher it took them about 40 minutes to get the fire out, and fortunately, you know, they, they were able to get under control quickly. Go back here. Um, and the building was back in business on Monday, two days after the crash. <laughs> so 14 people were killed. Um, they didn't find the captain's body for, um, I think they found him at the bottom of the elevator shaft um, a couple of days later. Um, they, um, this, they discovered a body had, um, where did the body fall to the bottom? This amazing story about the elevator operator in the building, she um, fell 75 stories when the cables were cut wow. and survived. So she's, she's known as the uh, Guinness Book of World Records, the longest survived elevator fall. Oh, wow. <laughs> And this is, this is what a B-25 looks like. A little bit different than the, the B-17 over here. Two less engines and a, couple, a little bit more in the tail there. So, And um, took off from Hanscom Air Force Base, which was... New messages received from plus one, <laughs> That was, that was five, a newspaper report. <laughs> and you can see exactly where the plane hit the Empire State Building. Right, right in the, uh, about 900 feet off the ground. And the, <clears throat> when it went in, the one the one wing sheared right off. The other one went into the building. So um, kind of interesting how that happened. Uh, this this is my favorite photo right here. The reporter's right on the ledge. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Oops. Oops. this photo where the uh, reporters are right, <laughs> right on the ledge. How did they take that picture? <laughs> no idea. Idea. Pretty, pretty incredible. <laughs> and this was, this was the fireman inside. Uh, this, this photo kind of cracked me up because there was um, um, two guys with axes trying to chop the plane up. <laughs> so a little, little short on tools for the job. And this is a little diagram of how the <clears throat> elevator shaft got cut off of the engine. So you can see how one engine went straight through the building, the other one went straight down. 
and that was that was the elevator shaft in the basement of the cables. And that's that's uh, Mar that's Mary Lou Oliver, <laughs> elevator, I should say, Oliver, who survived the crash. She was she was walking around a few days later. So a little bit of trivia. So how how was Massachusetts connected to both the 9/11 uh, World Trade Center Flight 11, uh, the crash into the uh, World Trade Center and the Empire State B-25 crash. Any guesses? Planes took off. Was it? Planes left. You just said one plane left and a half is coming. Both planes were from Massachusetts, so we have something against New Yorkers, I guess. Don't say. You wonder why there's a rivalry. And one of the little bit better trivia in here too was that Handsome Field was named after a newspaper reporter. Um, who was big on aviation, and he ended up having crashing his plane in Saugus back in 1941. So you, can, you guys can look that one up if you're interested. So this crash kind of, I was on this database that I saw, I found out about this crash, and when I was on there, I was looking for other plane crashes during, during the war, and that's how I stumbled across a plane crashing in North Reading. And it was the, the B-17 flying course, which we have a model of it over here, and I've got lots of pictures of it. Um, this is a, an early early version of it in um, 1940. Dropping some, a whole bunch of bombs out of the uh, bomb bay there. Some uh, great footage of the contrails of the planes flying. And uh, it's also the B-17's famous, the, the Memphis Bell. And I did, I did like how my name was on the plane there, too. So. <laughs> That doesn't hurt, I guess. Um, I got a question. Sure. The swastika is on the left hand side of the drama. What does that mean? That yeah. they killed, but, got a German plane? Or yeah, I don't know exactly, but my, my guess would be that they were, when they bomb the bomb would actually hit a German target. That's like a fire shot down by the American. The firm kill. An airplane, a bomb, a bomb. There we go. It's perfect. Like I said, I'm not a historian, but I love history. So, <laughs> but yeah, any, any audience help is great for this. So, um, this is the inside of the cockpit of a uh, of a P-17. And one of the things that um, came out of the whole B-17 um, production. Oh wait a minute, this is the Was the bomber jacket? Um, this is the. And you can see why it was, a lot of times in these, when they were flying these missions, it was, now luckily they didn't have a wind chill, but it was uh, minus 40 degrees up there. So they need to be as bundled up as possible, and the shearling and the, and the leather really, um, really kept them warm. But not the best of conditions flying, for sure. <coughs> the typical B-17, the B-17 was a crew of 10. Um, and so you positioned on the plane, you had your, um, the pilot and the co-pilot right up here. Uh, you had your bombardier, probably the most dangerous position, especially when they were getting open head on. The uh, show me where they are on point. Yeah, that's the bombardier. Yeah. There's the bombardier. It's right there. Right there. The lowest one. The front. The front. Oh, in the front. Yeah. Um, you had the upper turret gunner right up here, and uh, the two. These guys are called the waist gunners back here because they would shoot out both sides of the plane. Um, pretty obvious, the tail gunner in the back, and these are all the, the escape, the escape uh, routes to get out of the plane if it was going down. That was the, that was the radio, um, radio station, that was the, the other position in the plane. And you can see there was a lot of room in these things, they were pretty, pretty narrow um, and you know, tight quarters moving around. We've got a little video so you can get some of the action. And I learned last night when I was trying this, you have to play around for a little bit to get it to work. So.
very tight formation so they could shoot as many um, German planes down in a, in a tight cluster. So it was, uh, it was critical for them to be very, very tight formation. So that gives you some idea of the, the, the action that these, these planes had. Um, so some of the key information about the B-17, um, originally when the plane came out, it did not get off to a good start. It was Boeing put a tremendous amount of um, money and energy into getting the project going to bid on it. And they made half a dozen or so planes and um, lost, they, they, <clears throat> when they were um, uh, bidding on it, like, a test pilot, um, actually a famous test pilot was killed um, demonstrating the plane, so they actually lost the, um, lost the government contract for it. Um, there were a total, but <clears throat> as, as the war went on and there was a, a demand, they were the only heavy duty fighter almost ready to be, you know, stamped out and produced. So they ended up winning the, gradually winning the contract in the, um, uh, in the early 40s of 1941, 42. So you can see the first three years, there was only um, about 120 or so uh, produced. And then you can see how it really ramped up the last few years where we got to 12,700 bombers. Wow. Um, the bomber that crashed here in North Reading was the B-17B. It was one of, the, one of the early ones, more of a prototype. Uh, this, is, this is the actual B-17Bs. There was like total of 39 built, but these were like the first eight or nine that were produced out in Seattle. Here's a couple of photos on the ground. One in flight. And some were used for, te they used them for all different purposes originally because they didn't, they weren't, we weren't at war yet when they first came out. So they did some testing out in um, Alaska. Um, the first production was the B-17 was the, uh, the 299M, and as, as time went on, they made these planes more powerful, put bigger engines in them, got, got bigger payloads, so they could carry bigger payloads, and wow. <coughs> these are just some statistics about the planes. Um, So all 39 of the, B, of the uh, B-17Bs are delivered by um, <clears throat> to the U.S. Army Air Corps between July 29, 1939 and March 30, 1940. So, um, <clears throat> and they were issued to the 2nd, 7th, and 19th bomb bombardment groups, um, except for the first example, which is retained for, for testing. Um, all right, can you talk, yeah. slow down and talk about it? Sure, definitely. <laughs> So many B-17s were modernized in 1940 and 1941 to use such features as the um, flush type side openings for the 50 um, caliber inch, 50 inch machine guns that have been uh, introduced in the B-17C. Um, a B-17B serving in the 41st reconnaissance squadron in a second bom um, bomb, bomb group based in Newfoundland attacked the U-boat on October 27, 1941. This is before the war actually started. Uh, although the U-boat was, was undamaged, the attack um, was the first in which bombs were dropped in anger by the Army Air Forces in action against German forces. Since the United States was officially not at war with Germany at the time, it was an incident <coughs> was not reported in the press. So it's kind of catch. That was a, a little secret there. So these are the um, of the group um, first first B-17Bs that were um, produced. <coughs> You can see uh, number eight was the one that crashed here in North Reading. Um, but most of them, uh, none of them really survived. They were either uh, scrapped or um, uh, repurposed for like training uh, on the ground. And that's just all the serial numbers of the planes that were produced. 
So when we talk about the crash here in North Reading, where did the plane uh, originate from? It was in the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force uh, Station up in Canada, Newfoundland. Which, when you think of that, it's not much of a place up there. It's you know, Newfoundland, way, way uh, up, up, up the coast. They get about 15 feet of snow during the winter, and they have about you know, one or two months of summer. That's it. So, uh, about six, six months before Pearl Harbor happened, um, President Roosevelt directed his Secretary of War to take full responsibility of delivering planes to be flown um, to England um, and the ultimate point of takeoff because it was a very, the shortest distance to get over there. Um, he added, I'm anxious to cut um, through all the formalities that are not legally prohibitive to help the British get this job done with dispatch. Uh, Gander's role in accomplishing this mission began that same month when the United States established the Newfoundland Army Air Base um, of the 21st Reconnaissance Squadron. And you can see where, where Gander is there, basically in the middle of nowhere. And that was the actual air base the plane took off from. And I, I love some of these patches, so this is one of the, uh, one of the cool Gander patches. And this is the, the planes that are actually on the airfields in the, B, the B-17D is right here. And this is the, uh, the early, um, <coughs> early patches from the 21st Recon uh, Ex Expeditionary Reconnaissance Squad. They did a lot of, uh, a lot of missions at a time. They, once the war started, they became the 429th of the Army Squad, which is what this what the plane crash was, was part of. And this was the original patch of the, uh, of the squadron. And you can see a couple different versions of it. And this is what, this is what it evolved to in the, in the modern era. That's the 429th. So what was the mission of this plane that, that crashed here? Any, any guesses? And anyone know the real story? Okay. So, the mission was pretty simple. Fly from Gander um, and, and land in, uh, outside of Philadelphia at the, uh, the Warminster uh, Naval um, uh, Development Center to get outfitted for, uh, for future, um, future activity. Unfortunately, they didn't quite make it. It's just a little bit, a little bit more compact map you can see. So this is the, this is where they're supposed to go, the Johnsville Naval Air Development Center. And um, shortly after this plane crash, they were acquired. That center was acquired by the Navy for um, all kinds of strategic weapons um, outfitting and development. And that's the, that's the. This is where they're supposed to land. So at 3.10 in the afternoon here in, in North Reading, the plane, now just to give you a little backdrop, it was July 18th and a rare foggy day, so not, not your typical July day, 1942. The, um, this is a little description from the, you know, actually in the handout too. Um, <clears throat> at 3.20, um, World War II, uh, 16 year old uh, Geek Stevens uh, heard through the cold mist the sound of an aircraft in trouble um, near his home at the Red Hill Country Club, uh, not far off Route 62. Uh, he ran outside to see a B 17 uh, Flying Fortress bomber uh, on descent to death. Um, the airmen who Stevens saw and nine other men, uh, other men died in the crash, heading from their home base in Newfoundland, where they um, may have been involved in submarine bombing missions, which it wasn't a submarine bombing mission, but that's what the newspaper thought at the time. Um, where they were going, what caused the crash during World War II has not been revealed. Um, initially there were seven victims, and later the list was increased to ten. And this is the... Anyone know what the, uh, the R and the H stand for? Red Hill. Red Hill, exactly. You drop right out, you can see that. Even though it's called the Hill V today, though. So, so, this, so it was a foggy day, the plane was trying to, was, the pilot was having some type of trouble, either the, um, the wings were getting heavy or um, okay. the visibility was, 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 was So, the plane descended very rapidly. 
and um, probably ran into uh, what they call the butter, where the, um, the wing shakes uncontrollably, and eventually the wing came off the plane. And as, so the, the, you know, this is a very powerful plane, so the pilot was doing his best to control it with the four engines, but um, this house over on Oakdale Road actually had the chimney taken right off of the plane. So the, the government actually paid to rebuild the house and put a new chimney on it. That's, that's over on Oakdale. Could you speak a little louder, please? Sure. <laughs> so, uh, when you look at Oakdale Road, I'm just going to point it. So this is where the, the house is at 57 Oakdale Road. Um, actually, right here, I'm sorry. This is 57 Oakdale. This was the flight path, and as it came, clipped the chimney of this, this house, started taking out um, all the trees. It ended up landing right over on Schoolhouse Lane, right, be, right behind the high school. Can you hear him? So this was, it was about a hundred yard debris field. Um, this is looking up, um, just looking up Belmont Ave, uh, up into the crash site, which is probably right over here. Anyone familiar with the, the cul-de-sac down in Schoolhouse Lane? So that's, the crash site's right up from there. Uh, this is a little newspaper footage from all the people coming out to see what was going on with the crash. Now, when the, when the crash occurred, it was in, this was kind of a remote area. There weren't any homes there. There wasn't um, really any way to get in there. And from some of the property lines I was able to come up with, here again, this is Oakdale Road, if you can see the cursor right there. The town had to cut a road into this area to get to the, get to the plane crash. So if you go down here, it's, this is what I speculate was the... Can you speak louder, please? I'm an old man. I'm kind of deaf. Can I shout? Yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So this is this is where some of the um, uh, supplies and the food was actually served on this flat rock. Some of the, some of the eyewitness accounts. So if you go down to uh, school hustling, you'll see it on the left. But that was um, that kind of marks the spot. So I was able to get a hold of the um, the restricted. Um, uh, uh, crash accident report. And before I do that, I'm gonna. This is a, a quick one-minute video. Of <coughs> what, what flutter is? So you get an idea of what might have happened to the plane. too technical on what flutter is, but basically it's, it's very just... Flutter is very destructive. So what we think happened to the plane was when it was descending, that's when the, the flutter happened and actually disengaged part of the wing from, from the plane. I came in late. Can I ask a question? Sure. Where was it going? What was the destination? 
The destination was, it was trying to get to just outside of Philadelphia. There, actually, the, the rumor was they was trying to get to the now the closed the then closed uh, North Reading Airport. There was like a there was an airstrip in North Reading. Yeah. Where was that? That was good question. That's I mean that's what all the newspaper accounts said. So. Good. I believe it was by Park Street by the high tension wire where the high tension wire is. That, that's that's what I heard too. Yeah. So the pilot was desperately trying to find a place to land. So this this plane was interesting because it had some top secret cargo on it. Actually, it was a very small piece of cargo. You ever, ever anyone ever heard of one of these? The Norton bomb site, exactly. This is a pilot actually using one. That's an actual top secret declassified uh, picture of one. Yeah, they were, yeah. Wow. And this has a little a schematical diagram of a parts list. I'm going to. I'm going to explain what a Norton is in a second. I'm going to tell you all about the, the Norton bomb site.
But Carl Norton is really the one who cracks the code. And he comes up with this incredibly complicated device. weighs about 50 pounds. Um, it's called the Norton Mark 15 bombsight. And it has all kinds of levers and ball bearings and gadgets and gauges. And, and um, it, he makes this complicated thing. And what, what he allows people to do is he takes, makes the bombardier take this particular object, visually sight the target, target right, because they're in the plexiglass cone of the bomber. And then they plug in the altitude of the plane, the speed of the plane, the speed of the wind, and the coordinates of the, of, of the target. And the bomb site will tell him when to drop the bomb. Right? And as Norton famously says, you know, before that bomb site came along, bombs would routinely miss their target by a mile or more. But he said with the Mark 15 Norton bomb site, he could drop a bomb into a pickle barrel at 20,000 feet. <laughs> now, I cannot tell you how incredibly excited the U.S. military was by the news of the Norton bomb site. It was like manna from heaven. Here was an army that had just had experience in the First World War, right, where millions of men fought each other in the trenches, getting nowhere, making no progress. And here someone had come up with uh, a device that allowed them to fly up in the skies high above enemy territory and destroy whatever they wanted with pinpoint accuracy. And the U.S. military spent $1.5 billion dollars billion dollars, in 1940 dollars, wow. developing a Norton bomb site. And to put that in perspective, uh, the total cost of the Manhattan Project was three billion dollars. Half as much money was spent on this Norton bomb site as was spent on the most famous military industrial project of the modern era. And there were people, strategists within the U.S. military, who genuinely thought that this single device was going to spell the difference between defeat <coughs> and victory when it came to the battle against the Nazis and against the Japanese. And for Norton as well, this device had incredible moral importance because Norton was a committed Christian. In fact, he would always get upset when people referred to the bomb site as his invention because in his eyes, only God could invent things. He was simply the instrument of God's will. And what was God's will? Well, God's will was that the amount of suffering in any kind of war be reduced to as small amount as possible. And what did the Norton bomb site do? Well, it allowed you to do that. It allowed you to bomb only those things that you absolutely needed and wanted to bomb. So in the years leading up to the Second World War, the U.S. military buys 90,000 of these <coughs> bomb sites at a cost of $14,000 each again in 1940. That's a lot of money. And they train 50,000 bombardiers in how to use them. Long, extensive months-long training sessions, because these things are essentially analog computers. They're not easy to use, right? And they make every one of those bombardiers take an oath to swear that if they're ever captured, they will not divulge a single detail of this particular device to the enemy, because it's imperative the enemy not get their hands on this absolutely central piece of technology. And whenever the Norton bomb set is taken onto a plane, it's escorted there by a series of armed guards. And it's carried in a box with a canvas shroud over it, right? And the box is handcuffed to one of the guards. And it's never allowed to be photographed. And there's a little incendiary device inside of it. So that if the plane ever crashes, it will be destroyed. And there's no way the enemy can ever get their hands on it. The Norton bomb site is the Holy Grail. So what happens during the Second World War? Well, what's that? It's not the Holy Grail. In practice, the Norton bomb site could drop a bomb into a pickle barrel at 20,000 feet, but that's under perfect conditions. And of course, in wartime, conditions aren't perfect. First of all, it's really hard to use, really hard to use. And not all of the people who are, not those 50,000 men who are bombardiers, have the ability to properly program an analog computer. Secondly, it breaks down a lot, right? It's full of all kinds of gyroscopes and pulleys and gadgets and ball bearings, and they don't work as well as they ought to in the heat of battle. Thirdly, when Norton was making his calculations, he assumed that a plane would be flying at a relatively slow speed at low altitudes, right? Well, in a real war, you can't do that. You get shot down. So they start flying them at high altitudes, at incredibly high speeds, and the Norton bombsite doesn't work as well under those conditions. But most of all, the Norton bombsite required the bombardier to make visual contact with 
the target. But of course, what happens in real life? There are clouds. Right? It needs cloudless sky to be really accurate. Well, how many cloudless skies do you think there were above Central Europe between 1940 and 1945? Right? Not a lot. And then to give you a sense of just how inaccurate the Norton bombsite was, there was a famous case in 1944 where the Allies bombed a chemical plant in Leuna, Germany. And the chemical plant comprised 757 acres. And over the course of 22 bombing missions, the Allies dropped 85,000 bombs on this 757 acre chemical plant using the Norden bomb site. Well, what percentage of those bombs do you think actually landed inside the 700 acre perimeter of the plant? 10%? 10%. And of those 10% that landed, 60% didn't even go off. They were duds, right? The Leona chemical plant, after one of the most extensive bombings in the history of the war, was up and running within weeks. And by the way, all those precautions to keep the Norton bombsite out of the hands of the Nazis, well, it turns out that, that Carl Norton, as a proper Smith, was very enamored of German engineers. So in the 1930s, he hired a whole bunch of them, including a man named Herman Long, who in 1938 gave a complete set of the plans for the Norton bombsite to the Nazis. So they had their own Norton bombsite throughout the entire war, which also, by the way, worked very well. <laughs> so why do we talk about the Norton bombsite? Well, because we live in an age where there are lots and lots of Norton bombsites. Right? We live in a time where there are all kinds of really, really smart people running around saying that they've invented gadgets that will forever change our world. They've invented websites that will allow people to be free. They've invented some kind of this thing or this thing or this thing that will make our world forever better. You go into the military, you'll find lots of Carl Nordens as well. If you go to the Pentagon, they will say, you know what, now we really can put a bomb inside a pickle barrel at 20,000 feet. And you know what, it's true. They actually can do that now. But we need to be very clear about how little that means. In the Iraq War, the beginning of the first Iraq War, the U.S. military, the Air Force, sent two squadrons of, of F-15E fighter eagles to the Iraqi desert, equipped with these five million dollar cameras that allowed them to see the entire desert floor. And their mission was to find and to destroy, remember the Scud missile launchers? Those, those, those surface to air missiles that the Iraqis were launching at the Israelis? The mission of that two squadrons was to get rid of all the Scud missile launchers. And so they flew missions day and night, and they dropped thousands of bombs, and they fired thousands of missiles in an attempt to get rid of this particular scourge. And after the war was over, there was an audit done, as the Army always does, the Air Force always does, and they asked the question, how many Scuds did we actually destroy? Do you know what the answer was? Zero! Right? Not a single one. Now why is that? Is it because their weapons weren't accurate? Oh no. They were brilliantly accurate. They could have destroyed this little thing right here from 25,000 feet. The issue was they didn't know where the scud launchers were, right? <laughs> the problem with bombs and pickle barrels is not getting the bomb inside the pickle barrel. It's knowing how to find the pickle barrel, right? That's always been the harder problem so with going up to fight. Or take the battle in Afghanistan. What is the signature weapon of the CIA's war in Northwest Pakistan? It's the drone. What is the drone? Well, it is the grandson of the Norton Mark 15 bombsite. It is this weapon of devastating accuracy and precision. And over the course of the last six years in Northwest uh, Pakistan, the CIA has flown hundreds of drone missiles and has used those drones to kill 2,000 suspected Pakistani and uh, Taliban militants. Now, what is the accuracy of those drones? Well, it's extraordinary. We're now, we think we're now at 95% accuracy when it comes to drone strikes. 95% of the people we kill need to be killed, right? That is one of the most extraordinary records in the history of modern warfare. Do you know what the crucial thing is? In that exact same period that we've been using these drones with devastating accuracy, the number of attacks, of suicide attacks, and terrorist attacks against American forces in Afghanistan has increased tenfold. As we have gotten more and more efficient in killing them, they have become angrier and angrier and more and more motivated to kill us. I have not described to you a successful
success story, right? I described to you the opposite of a success story. And this is the problem with our infatuation with the things we make. We think that things we make can solve our problems, but our problems are much more complex than that. The issue isn't the accuracy of the bonds you have. It's how you use the bonds you have, and more importantly, whether you ought to use bonds at all. There's a, there's a postscript um, in the book, story of Paul Gordon and his fabulous bomb site. And that is on August 6, 1945, when he was 29 bomber called the Enola Gay flew over Japan. And using a Norton bomb site, dropped a very large thermonuclear device on the city of Hiroshima. And as was typical with the Norton bomb site, the bomb actually missed its target by 800 feet. But of course, it didn't matter. Right? And that's the greatest irony of all when it comes to the Norton bomb site. The Air Force's $1.5 billion bomb site was used to drop its $3 billion bomb, which didn't need a bomb site at all. Meanwhile, back in New York, no one told Carl Norton that his bomb site was used over Hiroshima. He was a committed Christian. He thought he had designed something that would reduce the toll of suffering in war. He would have broken his heart. So anyway, that was the, the real story on the Norton bomb site. So, um, so one of the interesting um, stories was the actual witness of the plane when it went, went down um, over by the hill, when it started its descent by the hill here. So uh, anyone know Gig Stevens? Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he, was, he witnessed this, and as, as a result, I think it had a major impact on his life. Uh, he, came a, he went to war. He um, was a 30-year airline executive. So that's, I think, one of the untold stories about making the connection between the, the newspaper um, article back in 1942 to... <coughs> He passed away in 2014. And so with that, so in, in memory of the, um, the, ten, the 10 men who perished, um, can someone tell me when, the, when, when did the veterans put the, the plaque together? I think 1994 or something like that? It was dedicated in 1995. 95, right. So the, when you go up there, when you go up to the top of the hill, uh, by the senior center, you can see the in the top right the the, the names of the ten pilots who perished, or the ten the yeah. ten crew. This is a little map I made of, of where perished. they were all from. You can see as far as Seattle, um, Philadelphia, New York, um, the pilot was from Mississippi, and I was able to find a picture of him. That was the pilot, um, Marion Kleiss. And uh, just want to thank you guys for allowing me to present the uh, B-17 bomber. Crash. You mentioned something about the plane that went down had a secret cargo. It did. Mm -hmm. and what, what was it? That was a Norden bomb site. Mm -hmm. oh. A what bomb site? The Norden bomb site, the one that they that um, oh. Malcolm Gladwell was talking about. So did they ever find them out? The um, the bomb site? Probably. The, 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 uh, a state trooper and uh, a civilian actually found it um, shortly after the crash. Had it exploded? No. It was, it was intact and they, they secured it at the, um, the state police barracks for the military to come get it. So this plane was actually being designed and developed during the late 30s? Correct. We actually had it at the time of Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Where were they headed for? They were they were headed for a um, to get outfitted down outside of Philadelphia. They were getting outfitted for probably bombing missions. Yeah, uh, but they weren't on a bombing trip. No, they were just they were just flying, trying to get out of Newfoundland, I think, for, <laughs> for a little while. The B-17s, I know, uh, the last stop before they went overseas, like the B-17s, uh, went to Manchester to get outfitted out for armaments and all this stuff. So it looked like they might have been going to Manchester. Is that right? No, this was really early, so this is even before. This is really early in the, the whole process, so they were they were repurposing this plane for some other use. Are there yeah. any artifacts of the wreckage? 
I'd love to find some, but you know, my, my guess is when the, um, it was a pretty large debris field, you know, a couple hundred yards, um, you know, in, in total distance. So my guess is there would have been probably some pieces when they were um, building new high school that probably were uncovered, but no one knew about it. Yeah, the, uh, that plane, the way I see it, they were headed for Vernia Field in Manchester. That was the point before they went overseas. The B-17, the B-24 ended up at Westover Field before they went overseas. That's where they got finally all fitted. I don't know. But this, this particular plane that crashed here was on its way to um, Philadelphia area. Where? To Philadelphia. Warminster, PA. Pennsylvania. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. What was the history declassified? Good, good question. I, you know, I look at that report. It was, um, I want to say probably like in the fifties, but I'm not, I'm not positive. In the back. Um, we're really, I mean, obviously, back in those days, it was radio navigation based on AM radio stations. That was it. You went to a station, you turned left, you went right, and then you possibly found the airline, the airfield you were trying to um, land at. Those guys were obviously in distress. They were at high altitude trying to make a transition to Pennsylvania. They had issues. So, yeah, something was going on with, you know, don't know exactly what it was, but it was clear they had to descend very quickly. And, and that caused the structural failure in the plane. So you said there was an airstrip on, near Park Street. Whereabouts on Park Street? You know, I, I've been trying to find it. I haven't been able to locate it. So if well, anyone has any information on Damon and Park Street. Oh. Over, over Damon, by the power lines, Damon, right? Damon and Gould, yeah. 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 Was, was it an airstrip or an airport? airport. Supposedly yeah, it, it was listed as an airport. Yeah. When did, the, small when did that uh, Tom? close? Yeah, I understand it was one of those kind of old-fashioned uh, grass airports. And uh, the, um, there was a, even a little building there, a, um, a restaurant or inn that was, I guess, actually you find early advertisements in the, in the newspapers so that was called, it was called the Aerial Inn. And I think it was just like a little small... Uh, um, it, was, it was like leftover from the airstrip? That was leftover there. from the airstrip. And apparently, one, one, one story I heard that it was that the building later became part of the Stardust Lounge yeah. in its first <laughs> incarnation. Before the building burned into the building. Yeah. So uh, other questions or? Go ahead. I, I thought that Gig Stevens mentioned the fact that it clipped the trees. It did. So, but you're saying that there was a, a the, the wings were failing, is that what? Yeah, they found the wing closer to where the hillview was, uh, but, and but the crash site was much further on. The, was it like, by hitting the trees, that would knock the wing, wing down? In the accident report, they said that the wing wasn't damaged. So that was, okay, so that's why they, they considered flutter as the um, accident cause, because it just came off right after the engine. Go ahead. Were they on their own, or were they part of a formation, or did they have a fire escort? They were all by themselves, because again, they, they didn't have a lot of these B, B-17Bs, and they were just like a one-off up there. Go ahead. I seem to remember from an old Eagle Tribune reprint that when the team was coming down, they fired some of the machine guns to warn the people that it was coming down. Have you ever heard that? Or that, was, that was true, yeah. They, they were trying, and that's one of the things from Gig Stevens' account, was that they were firing machine guns like crazy to, to warn people that the plane was on its way down. So the, the waste gunners were, were firing like crazy. You couldn't see it with a foggy day. I mean, the, the ceiling was like, you know, a couple hundred feet. In the back, go ahead. Is it true that it landed in Eisenhower Pond? No, it, landed, it, it basically crashed closer to where the new high school is, Schoolhouse Lane. But it did circle around a few times. That, that was the eyewitness account that it, 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 it was trying to find a place to land. and couldn't find, couldn't find that. Did get hold of the land, stuck, stuck in the clouds. Yeah, I mean there wasn't there wasn't much in the way of you know any place to land. Go ahead, sir. Tremendous fire. Yeah. Yeah, so, and they probably were getting, you know, they had a, a good range, so they probably still had a lot of gas, gasoline left in the, in the tanks. 
Over here, do you have a question? Yeah, so the, um, the only landmark that remains of the wreckage is that rock, basically, that was in the that they had. That's, I mean, I don't think, I, I haven't come across any any artifacts from the crash. I mean, they tried to clean up as Not much as they artifacts, but um, on the site itself. Uh, there's. Yeah, the, the only thing that they have a rock that they yeah. used way back then, right? Uh, yeah, to like set up a canteen right, and, right, and right. serve the, the, the rescue workers. But I'd love to find a piece of the plane. There must be one hanging around here somewhere. Does so. anybody ever use metal to take these things in the I'd like to. I just, you know. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start a club. <laughs> we need members. That's it. They closed that whole area off for over a week, so I think they got every single piece that was in there. Yes, yeah, they think. And you have Belmont and School Hill and the high school and all of that built. So when they all did like, any excavation, they yeah. like you said, took out pieces of the in there. How soon was the, the bomb site, which would have been the thing that everybody was looking for? Right. How soon was it recovered? Like, like, like week? No, like hours. That was the account they found it right away. So they talked about how the police secured it, locked it up, and um, the state trooper had it, you know, handcuffed to him or something like that. So. Go ahead. As you probably know, the Veterans Memorial, Memorial Committee was able to contact some of the uh, family members of the crew, and, and they came up. Uh, there were either five or, or, or nine, I'm not just sure, came up for the dedication. And they never knew. How, you know, they. They knew that their loved one had been killed in action, but they were never told where. Yeah, a lot of them didn't know the story. They just said, you know, killed in action and a you know a crash, but they didn't know what happened here in North Reading. And I think a couple of the um, families came up to, you know, family members came up to the memorial. Anything, anything else? What, anything to add? Anything to um, ask questions on? All right. Well, just again, I want to thank you very much. It was it's a fun topic to talk about.